So as they said, motherhood is complicated. Um, but I want to just take a moment and remind all of the women in the room that motherhood is about more than just giving birth. God has called us as women to bring life into the situations where he has positioned us. I read this week that two of the strongest muscles in the body are the uterus and the tongue. <laughs> the uterus weighs around six ounces but can push out a six to eight pound baby. And we all know how powerful the tongue is. Proverbs 18.21 says that the tongue holds the power of life and death. So I want us to, to be reminded today, ladies, that we have the opportunity in every situation where God positions us to speak life, to bring life. And whether you haven't yet, uh, can't, don't have the desire to bring life from your uterus, you have the opportunity to bring life with your tongue into the situations where you are. So I, I just want to leave you with that today. We want to celebrate womanhood, biblical womanhood. Um, and so we are encouraging you to go to our sisterhood um, social media feeds, Facebook, Instagram, and there's a coupon code on there for a free Starbucks. So treat yourself, okay? Um, there is a limit. It's not a forever thing. So make sure you do that today, okay? Awesome. Um, Today we're continuing in the book of Acts, and we will be in chapter 12. If you were here last week and you heard Pastor Ryan speak, you know that he was in chapter 10, and you might be thinking, okay, are we just forgetting about chapter 11? We're coming back to that next week. Pastor Daryl is going to be teaching on that powerful message. I want to encourage you to be here for that. So quick recap. 14 years have passed from Acts chapter 1 to where we find ourselves today in Acts chapter 12. Now, I don't mean that we have been in this series for 14 years. It's been a long series. But, I mean, actually, historically, it's been 14 years from the moment Jesus ascended back into heaven to where we find ourselves in chapter 12. And I think that's significant because it's easy to miss. You know, it's easy to read the book of Acts and see all that God did and, and overestimate what we think he did in a short amount of time and underestimate what God will do over years of faithfulness. And in a culture where we want things now, and if it doesn't work out the way we want now, we just move on to what we think is greener pastures, we miss out on what God wants to do through our faithfulness and our perseverance. So I just thought that fact was important and wanted to share that with you. Um, Acts 1.8 is the key verse for everything that happens in this book. And in this verse, Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And then chapter 2 reveals the moment that the Holy Spirit came upon those early disciples and filled them with supernatural power. There was a distinct difference between those disciples before the Holy Spirit came on them and after. Um, throughout the book of Acts, you'll see that the stamp of authenticity on what God was doing in a person or in a group of people was the obvious power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we walk through chapter 12 today, I want you to remember that these disciples performed miracles. They saw thousands of people respond to the gospel, but they also faced persecution and resistance. And when they did, they just prayed for more boldness and kept going. I've thought over and over as we've been walking through the book of Acts and, and as we're diving in deeper into the book of Acts and growth track, I've had this thought, God, I want to see and experience what the early church did. You know, we've, we've seen amazing things here, the journey in 14 years, but to read the book of Acts and see all that those disciples experienced, I've, I've read that and I've thought, God, I want to see that. I want to experience that. I want to see thousands of lives changed. I want to see the obvious evidence of your power. And more than once, God has said to me, if you want what they had, you need to do what they did. If you want what the early church had, you need to do what the early church did. And I think that most of us in here and those joining us online would say, yes, we want a move of God. We need a move of God. And so I want to leave you with this thought today as we work through this chapter. If we want what the early church had, we have to do what the early church did. If we could pan out and get a 10,000-foot view of the church right now in 2021, I think we would see that there's a lot of division. There's a lot of distraction. There's a lot of complacency. And it feels like the church is losing sight of the mission that, that Jesus has entrusted us with. 
if, if you zoom in, if you get close, if you get connected to the body of Christ, you'll hear stories. God's still moving. God's still doing things here and in the church. You have to be close. You have to see those things. There are pockets where God is at work. And, and as I thought about the, that this week, I thought those are like embers in a fire that's gradually dying out. And you might think, well, man, you're a pessimist. But I think we have to be real about where we are if we want to get to where God wants us to be. These stories are like embers in a fire that seems to be gradually dying out. And we need to fan the flames if we want to see a move of God. And there's an urgency for us to fan the flames. There's an urgency because a lot is at stake. And in case you don't realize that, I want to remind you of what's at stake. See, we're at risk of spiritually losing most of the next generation. Studies show that by age 13, a person's worldview is already in place. And your worldview is your beliefs and your convictions that motivate and guide your life. If parents and the church aren't helping children and students develop a biblical worldview, I promise you social media and their peers will be discipling them. Mental and emotional health is at an all-time low. People are desperate and hurting. The CDC and the National Institute of Mental Health recently released data that shows the numbers for anxiety, depression, substance abuse, opioid overdose, and stress-related symptoms nearly doubled during the pandemic. While Christians are debating conspiracy theories, the world around us is desperate and hurting, and the most vulnerable around us need us to offer them hope and grace. That is who God has called us to be. So what do we do? If we believe that God has called us to love God, love people, and make disciples, we have to make that more than just a catchy phrase and make it a way of life. It has to be a way of life. And the book of Acts shows us how to do this. The early church did this. If we want what the early church had, we have to do what they did. And I want to focus on two things that they did. And these are things that God has challenged me with. So I'm not just throwing these out there for you. God has been dealing with me. And the very first thing, they were committed to holiness. And holiness can seem like this outdated churchy word. But scripture says that God is holy. And that means that he is unlike us. He is so different and so much greater than we are. Our minds cannot comprehend him. We can't grasp or understand the holiness and the greatness of God without the Holy Spirit. But understanding the holiness of God is essential if we are going to be holy. 1 Samuel 2.2 2 says, There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There's no rock like our God. God is holy. So what does, that, what does that mean for us? What does that have to do with me? His holiness compared to our brokenness reveals how much we need him. See, if we don't acknowledge his holiness... We will never value his forgiveness. And this is so important because our sin doesn't always seem that bad to us. You know, we minimize and we justify and we compare our sin to others. And this is so important. But in light of his holiness, we see our sin for what it really is. And we realize that that we can't do anything to save ourselves. There is such a chasm between our brokenness and his holiness. There's no way we can close that gap. But that's why he sent Jesus. That is why we have Jesus. And when we surrender to him, scripture says that we are made holy. And to be holy means that we have been set apart by God's grace for his purpose. Super simple understanding. To be holy means that we are set apart by his grace for his purpose. Our commitment is no longer to our success and happiness. Our commitment is to his purpose. And the Holy Spirit gives us the power to live that out. And you know what the result of holiness is? If we are committed to holiness, wholeness. Wholeness. Submitting to God's standards leads us toward wholeness. Away from brokenness, away from sin, and toward wholeness. Sin has left us broken. And God's standards give us a way to be made whole. But the problem is we've determined as a society that God's ways are outdated and irrelevant. The L.A. Times ran a story a few years ago about a Christian minister who said that Scripture is outdated and fossilized and needs to grow and change with modern times. It's not just the culture who has decided this. Many Christians have as well. 
And I want to share some stats with you that I think give an example of how we have drifted as the church away from God's standards. A recent survey by Pew Research revealed that 57% of self-identified Christians believe that sex between unmarried adults in a committed relationship is sometimes or always acceptable. 50% believe casual sex is sometimes or always acceptable. And I'm not holding sexual sin above any other sin. I just think this gives us a glimpse into how we've drifted from God's standard for our lives. And if you are unsure of what God's standard is, the Ten Commandments are a good place to start. 1 Corinthians 6.15 says, Don't you know that your bodies are a part of Christ's body? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, he has taken up residence in you. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. And you make him an involuntary participant in everything you choose to do. Think about that. You make him an involuntary participant in everything you choose to do. And we gradually move away from God's standards one small justification at a time. We become desensitized to sin because we're exposed to it. On the shows that we binge, in our social media feeds, in the content that we consume, and the more we're exposed to it, the more we accept it, the more we normalize it. And hear my heart, I'm not saying this with a pointed finger. I'm preaching to myself. And anytime we highlight sin and we put the spotlight on sin, we don't do so as a judge delivering a conviction. We should do it as a doctor acknowledging a disease and then offering the cure. Because anytime you acknowledge sin and you sound more like a judge than you do a compassionate doctor, you've missed the heart of God. And anytime you acknowledge sin without offering the cure, you've really missed the heart of God. Because the gospel is the cure. When we turn from our sin and we surrender to Jesus, he gives us grace. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit to, to move us towards wholeness and away from our brokenness. And the point isn't to try harder to be holy. The last thing I want is for you to go home today and say, I'm going to try harder to be holy. The answer is to surrender. It's to surrender. And I know this isn't popular teaching, but I love you enough to tell you Holiness isn't a burden to bear, it is a gift to steward. 1 Peter 1 verse 14 says, You must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do. Just as God who chose you is holy. For the scriptures say, you must be holy because I am holy. So what's the solution? If we've drifted from God's standard of holiness, he's given us the prescription, and it's repentance. Not self-loathing, not shame, not justification or minimizing our sin. It is repentance. It's turning from our brokenness and moving towards him, turning from our sin and say, God, I recognize that I've missed it, and I'm turning toward you. And then you hold on to 1 John 1, 9, because the accuser, Satan, is going to come to you, and he is going to try to convince you that you should be full of shame. And in that moment, you just say, 1 John 1, 9 says, if I confess my sin, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. And you keep moving towards Jesus. The early church was committed to holiness, and they were committed to prayer. And that's what we're going to see in our text today. Chapter 12 opens with Herod, the ruler of Judea, joining the Jewish, Jewish religious leaders in harassing the church, and he has James executed. James was one of Jesus' closest disciples. He was the brother of John. Now, there's another guy named James that you're going to meet in a few chapters, but this is a different guy. James and John were known as the sons of thunder because they had such huge personalities. If you've read Luke chapter 9, uh, you'll read about Jesus going through the town of Samaria, and they didn't receive him well. They weren't nice to him. And James and John said, God, um, Jesus, we want to pray down fire on this whole city. Like, that's James and John. And in Mark 10, they asked Jesus if they could each sit on his right and his left when he established his kingdom. They were still confused because they thought he was going to establish an earthly kingdom, and they wanted a place of prominence. And look at how Jesus responded. He said in verse 38, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? 
And they said, oh, yes, we are able. In verse 39, Jesus tell that, tells them that they would experience suffering, but he couldn't promise them a place on either side of his throne. Fast forward to Acts chapter 12, and right here we see Jesus' words coming true about James. Verse 3 says that Herod had him killed with the sword. James was present in the upper room in the beginning of Acts. And we read about his execution here in chapter 12, but there's nothing else mentioned about him. He didn't get the spotlight he wanted, but he still made an impact. Church history tells us that one of the soldiers guarding James was so moved, so impacted by his faith, that he declared himself a Christian too and was executed right, al right alongside James. Acts chapter 12 verse 3 says that when Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, how much executing James pleased them, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. The fact that Peter was arrested during the Passover actually worked to his advantage. Because of this religious holiday, Herod didn't have him immediately executed and he kept him in jail. And while Peter was in jail, Acts 12.5 says the church prayed very earnestly for him. And this is what I want you to see when we talk about prayer. The term very earnestly is a medical term that, that is the stretching of a muscle to its limits. Anybody ever pulled a muscle? Doesn't feel very good. The stretching of a muscle to its limits. It's the same word used to describe how Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mark 26, verse 36 said, Jesus went with them, the disciples, to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter, James, and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and watch with me. In Luke's account of Jesus praying in the garden, it says that he was in such agony that he, he sweat drops of blood. Jesus was in agony because he was wrestling with the reality that he would face on the cross. See, praying earnestly isn't us trying to convince God to do what we want him to do. It is wrestling our will to the ground so that we can surrender to his. Prayer is a wrestling match with our flesh to align our heart with God's heart. The church in Acts 12 was facing increased persecution. James had just been executed, and now Peter had been arrested. There was the real possibility that any of them could be next. And in, instead of praying that God protect them, they prayed for Peter while he was in prison. The saints in the past used a term that we don't hear very often, and it is the term to pray through. You have to pray through that. Anybody heard that? Has anyone told you they got to pray through? And it doesn't mean praying until God does what you want. It's praying through our weakness, praying through our unbelief. It is praying through the struggle to a place of surrender. I want you to think about the most significant thing that you're praying for right now. Is it your marriage? Is it your children? Is it physical or mental healing? Is it for the salvation of someone you love? Is it for freedom from an addiction? Can I challenge you to pray through? To pray through, wrestle your flesh to the ground until your heart is in line with God's. You so often when I'm facing something and I know that I need to pray about it, I give such token energy to prayer. You know, I mentioned it to God. In passing, I said, hey, God, would you do something in this situation? But how often does my prayer push me to that point of being stretched, to the place of surrendering my will to him? How desperate are you for God to move in that situation? And here's what I found. When we stop fighting for our way and we say, not my will but yours, it's usually in that moment that we see the breakthrough. It's usually in that moment we get the revelation or we get the answer. And it may not be what we started out praying for, but our heart's okay with that because now we want what God wants. And while the church was praying, Peter was sleeping. Acts 12, 6 says the night before Herod was to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. 
The only way Peter could sleep at a moment like this is because he believed that whatever happened, whatever the outcome was, God had a purpose and would be with him. I believe that Peter had prayed through. He had surrendered to God's will. But I also believe the prayers of the church fueled Peter's peace. 1 Timothy 2.1 says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people. And I wish I had time to go into each type of prayer mentioned in this verse, but I want to focus on intercession. The church was interceding for Peter. And in the original language, that term intercession means a falling in with. A falling in with. You've heard the term, they had a falling out. When there's a relational conflict, this is a falling in with. And you know what it means? It means that I am in this with you. I'm praying for you as if I was praying for myself. You might feel like your prayers aren't doing much. You might feel like praying for someone isn't significant. But can I tell you, your prayers may be the very thing giving someone strength and peace in a really difficult situation. Intercession is so important. They were committed to holiness. They were committed to prayer. And I can't teach this chapter without talking about Peter's freedom. Because as Peter was sleeping, an angel appeared and a bright light filled his cell. And he was sleeping so hard that the angel had to punch him in the side to wake him up. Any heavy sleepers in here? Some of y'all are sleeping right now. Any heavy sleepers? You can sleep through anything. The angel told Peter to get up and the chains fell off his wrist. And look what happened next. Acts 12 verse 8 says, Then the angel said to him, Put on your clothes and sandals. And Peter did so. Wrap your cloak around you and follow me, the angel told him. Peter Peter followed him out of the prison. Immediate obedience. That's something else that I see over and over in the book of Acts. Immediate obedience. But he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He thought he was seeing a vision. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city. It opened for them by itself, and they went through it. And when they had walked the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself, and he said, Now I know without a doubt that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were hoping would happen. God miraculously provided for Peter's freedom, but Peter had to actually do what he was told if he wanted to be free. You can have people praying for you, but when God tells you to move, you have to take those steps. No one can do that for you. There were supernatural things that God did, and there were specific things that Peter had to do. He had to wake up. He had to get up. He had to get dressed. He had to walk away from what was holding him captive, and I think that is the most important. Peter's chains fell off, but if he had not been obedient to walk out of his cell, he would have just been more comfortable in his bondage. He wasn't truly free until he walked away from what was holding him captive. Some of you have a relationship with Jesus, but you haven't walked away from what's holding you captive. You might be a little more comfortable in your prison cell, but you're not living free. And I don't know what's holding you captive. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's attitudes and a belief system that you've been holding on to. Maybe it's selfishness or greed or, or overspending or overeating. Maybe it's relationships that are keeping you in bondage. And maybe you're afraid to walk away from those things because that is where you're comfortable. And there's going to be a price to pay. You may lose relationships. You may have to go through withdrawal. You may have to go to recovery. You may have to make some choices that aren't easy, but God promises to be with you. And if you want to truly live free, you have to walk away from what's holding you captive. When Peter left his prison cell, the first thing he did was go to the people who were praying for him. And this is hilarious. He knocks, he goes to the home where, where the believers are meeting, and he knocks on the gate, and a girl named Rhoda comes to answer it. And when she saw that it was Peter, instead of opening the gate and letting him in, she turns around and runs back side, inside. Oh, my gosh, Peter's outside. And I want to go, come on, Rhoda. I mean, as women, we're already trying to overcome hundreds of years of stereotypes and, and all those things, and you're just supporting that. And so when they hear that Peter was standing outside, they didn't believe it. I mean, have you ever done that? You've, you've been praying for something. You've been asking God to do something. And then when he does it, you're surprised. I've been there. And they finally let Peter in. And he tells them the story of how God had set him free. Acts 1-8 says, you will be my witnesses. You know what that means? You will tell your story. 
There's such power in telling your story. Because the enemy will try every tactic possible to steal your freedom. And Revelation chapter 12 says that we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And the only way you're going to maintain your freedom is keep telling your story. And don't be naive. When you start telling your story, the enemy is going to up his game. But just keep telling it. Just keep telling it. Don't stop. Don't get distracted. And here's where I need to wrap this up. Pursuing holiness and praying earnestly are like jet fuel for the gospel. Acts 12, 24 says, Meanwhile, the word of God continued to spread, and there were many new believers. If we want what the early church had, we have to do what the early church did. And if faith is just something that you've added to your self-help checklist to make you feel better, you're not going to understand this. It's not going to make sense to you. But if you want to see God move in a miraculous way now, in your life and in this generation, we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to do what it takes? And so as we close out today, the team's going to come back and lead us in that song, Do It Again. Do we sing that often? We declare that often. God, we want you to do it again. Do we really want him to do it again? Are we willing to do what they did in order to see God move? Not just so that we can get excited, but so that this generation, this culture, our nation can see a God who is able to save, who is able to bring the hope and the healing that they need. So I'm going to pray today. This front is open for you. I'm not the Holy Spirit. You know what you need to do. He's already speaking to you. However God challenges you to respond, you do that as the team leads us. Let's pray together. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the, the book of Acts that shows us exactly who you've called us to be and how you've called us to live as your church. And I pray right now you would fill us with your spirit like we've never seen before. That the sacrifice and the generosity and all of the things that are a fruit of your spirit would become real and evident in our lives. That we would die to ourselves so that you could be seen as greater. And it is in the precious name of Jesus we pray.